today doing a presentation on the pedal manifestations of COVID-19. Uh, this will be a one hour CME uh, and you'll get an hour of credit. There'll be a code at the end of the uh, lecture uh, and we'll give you more information on how to gain credit for this. Uh, the hope is that this will be part of a lecture series put on by the IPMA, um, which will be uh, free opportunities for credits for everybody. Um, I wanted to in introduce Dr. Peter Lovato. He is a, a doctor and surgeon at Northern Illinois Foot and Ankle Specialists. Um, and uh, Dr. Lovato, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I wanted to get this going because there's a lot of news out there about COVID, what's been dubbed COVID toes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, buzz going in not only in the U.S. but around the world about what it is, um, how to treat it, um, you know, what it means. So we wanted to kind of start things off with uh, going over something that's on the forefront of a lot of our members' minds um, and uh, just give you a quick overview. Um, we will be taking questions throughout uh, the entire duration of this, so please feel free to post questions. Um, on the uh, on the Facebook site, as well as uh, um, just listen and hopefully learn. Um, so we wanted to start off with just giving a little bit of information out there. There's a, there's a lot of uh, correct and false information all over the web, but I uh, wanted to just talk real quick. So um, first, the presentation. Um, you know, I, some of you may have seen this and either not known what it was or seen it and you know maybe saw a news article and and, and thought maybe it could be, but um, most often it's described as uh, purple uh, bruise-like bumps and swelling. Uh, it's most common in the toes. It does all, uh, also happen in the fingers. Um, it resembles uh, most often like uh, early signs of frostbite or pernio chillbanes type of manifestation. Um, these uh, skin rashes may, as the uh, disease progresses, uh, may ulcerate turn necrotic, they can be painful. Uh, you can also get kind of burning, uh, tingling type of pain like you'll see in other types of viral skin lesions. Um, they're similar to, well, they have two different kinds of presentation. You see the vascular type, which is almost like a frostbite type. But then you also will also see reports uh, of kind of more chicken pox or measles type of lesion, the raised, multiple raised vesicles that you typically see in some of these viral lesions. Um, the lesions also may present on the trunk. There are some studies that have actually shown that it may even be more prevalent in the trunk. Um, and those typically are kind of uh, rashes that aren't raised. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's worth noting is that there, as of now, well, we're, we're, we're basically only getting case studies so we don't have a whole lot of high level evidence, but you know, we are getting a large number of case studies because there are so many um, cases around the world. Um, there is no correlation between having this rash and disease, uh, disease severity. That's worth noting. So just because you have the rash doesn't mean you're gonna get a real severe case of this disease. Some people have the rash and don't even develop symptoms. Um, the good news is that the lesions so far have been described as self-limiting, meaning that um, they may be painful, but they usually resolve within a period of two to three weeks. Um, uh, some of the case studies have described uh, symptoms starting as soon as two days after the presentation of these lesions. So it's, uh, it's not a bad screening tool. So if you do have the lesions, close monitoring uh, is indicated um, if there is no symptoms, you know, if they, if you do have a patient that has the typical symptoms of, uh, the coronavirus, uh, then it's makes sense to get them tested. Um, there is a relatively new registry that's come out, uh, that was started for the dermatology, uh, dermatologic manifestations in order to kind of catalog and get a better grasp of this, um, before, uh, uh, you know, we get high level evidence, which could take, you know, too long for people to benefit. Um, it, it is accessible to any practitioner to upload the data and, and can help better our understanding. Um, the percentage of how many patients that develop COVID toes that have the disease is unclear at this point. Um, the largest study to date came out of Italy. Uh, it did show that those numbers uh, were as high as 20% with just derma, uh, dermatological manifestations across the board. But those numbers did include the torso, they include the fingers. Um, 
So the percentage of COVID, do COVID toes is likely much less than that. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see if uh, anybody has any questions. If not, we can just uh, uh, move into kind of an update, an overall update on uh, uh, the disease as a whole. Why don't we start on an update on the disease process and then we can um, kind of circle back on some questions. Sounds good. So first, uh, a lot of questions I've gotten from patients and other practitioners uh, around our area is uh, with regard to testing. So currently, you know, I can only speak from the, you know, we're, we're in Northwestern Illinois. So we, uh, we get supplied by uh, the larger advocate system in, in Northwestern system. Um, so basically testing, in order to get a test, um, you need an order from a physician or to go through the hotline uh, through Northwestern in Illinois. Um, the uh, thing that it's worth noting is that there are two different kinds of tests. There's a molecular test, which is the PCR type, and then there's also the serology test, which tests the uh, antibodies. Um, the thing to be aware of is false negatives. Um, you know, I know that I've seen in a couple of uh, my patients that have tested positive in the hospital have actually had one to two false negative molecular or PCR tests before they actually had a positive test. Um, you know, talking with some of our infectious disease friends, uh, this can be a result of uh, it being too early in the disease process, you're starting to maybe display early signs of symptoms, but the test isn't positive. Um, so you can have false negative early in the disease. The numbers that I've been told have been that the sensitivity for the molecular test is uh, 95%. So it's a pretty good sensitivity. Um, but you do want to be aware of those false negatives and you don't, you don't want to ever drop your guard down just because you had a negative test. Stop wearing the, you know, the appropriate uh, prophylaxis PPE um, because you could end up, you know, going back and, and, and realizing you had a patient that's actually positive when you had a negative test when you saw them as a consult uh, yesterday. Um, also want to be aware of the false positives. Um, false positives are more prevalent in serology testing. Um, this is primarily due to a large amount of interference from all the different types of coronavirus out there. Um, False positive testing could be as high as 20 to 30%, but we really don't know those numbers yet. A lot of those serology tests uh, that were kind of sped to market because of the demand uh, by Abbott and other manufacturers, um, the research hasn't really been made public. Um, you know, it's likely that uh, most serology tests just increase the end value, not to get into the weeds with statistics, but just increase the end value, end value to account for the perceived interference from other coronavirus tests. Um, the retesting, if you're unsure of the result or you have a patient that's displaying clear symptoms and you want to make sure, um, currently in our systems, patient whose clinical radiographic presentation and or exposure history is consistent with COVID-19 without another cause, we can retest. Um, if patients have tested positive for an alternative diagnosis, uh, i.e. influenza, Type, uh, but uh, this clinical condition isn't improving or they're deteriorating rapidly, they're also eligible for a, a repeat test. Um, you know, currently, um, you know, to give you another update, um, you know, I'm sure everybody's experiencing, experiencing this, but, you know, all urgent emergent procedures uh, and surgeries uh, are now requiring COVID-19 testing uh, at Advocate and Northwestern, at least our hospitals, prior to coming back into the OR. Uh, that's largely because of the increased risk for um, uh, disease particulate and droplet uh, from intubation and extubation. Uh, so, you know, it is really important to understand that, you know, in our hospital is, is giving us N95s to use as surgical masks in the OR because the risk is so high with intubation and extubation. Um, it's important to take the proper droplet precautions. Uh, so make sure you are aware of that. Um, the uh, non-urgent ambulatory visits in the office uh, were extended through May 15th through the advocate system. And obviously that doesn't pertain to fractures, trauma, severe pain, infections, wounds that have to be seen on a weekly basis, you know, things of that nature. So we are still seeing patients in the office, but uh, we are uh, donning the appropriate prophylaxis, and we're screening everybody at the door. And, and I think at this point, everybody's pretty much doing that. Um, 
you know, if, if you if you have an excess of masks, you have someone that's a high risk but has to be seen, uh, you can give them a mask. Um, you know, some people have even gone so far as to give people gloves at the front desk. You can uh, install kind of face shields for your front desk support, like some of the grocery stores are doing um, to help keep your staff safe, things like that. I got a question here, Pete. Yeah. Um, as far as treatment for the lesions, uh, when people have the lesions, and I know worst case scenario is they start to ulcerate. Um, what is, how do you get into treatment and what kind of treatments are you looking at? So uh, right now, um, treatments uh, are, because the, because the lesions are actually self-limiting, um, treatment is really only um, geared towards managing the pain. Um, and, you know, to date, the lesions are going away within two to three weeks. So typically, we're just watching these lesions. Um, you know, if, if I've seen, you know, some dermatologists, you know, apply a, you know, topical pain cream, things of that nature, but really, it's just geared towards um, managing the symptoms. Uh, because the good news is that these lesions will resolve on their own. And uh, as of what we know now, and obviously this is all changing by the day, but as of what we know now, they are not causing any long-term symptoms. But we won't know that, obviously, until you know, we uh, get months and years down the line. And another question that was asked, are you seeing a big difference, or have you heard of a big difference between children versus adults? So that's a great question. Um, the lesions are most prevalent in children and adolescents. Um, very young children, you know, we're talking, you know, kids, you know, under uh, one year. I haven't seen any case studies yet. Um, that doesn't mean they're not there, but, you know, the prevalence probably is so low that we're not seeing them. Um, uh, older adults, it can happen. It is less likely. Most of the case studies that are coming out of uh, France, Italy, U.S., around the world are in children and adolescents. And what about mimicking other types of disease processes? And, um, you've mentioned chill lanes before mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, other viral types of things. Are there other things that these may be mistaken for? Yeah, so most commonly, you know, in the U.S. right now, um, people are describing the symptoms as kind of an early frostbite type, whether it's chill veins, pernio, things of that nature. Um, the other things that, you know, this, these skin manifestations can look like uh, are chickenpox, measles, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Basically, any, any, most viruses that produce uh, skin manifestations, these, you know, uh, these lesions, you know, can be burning and can be painful, just like uh, other viral lesions, but uh, um, they are uh, easy to uh, misdiagnose. And, you know, it is worth noting that, you know, the, uh, these other diseases are, are out there, you know, so just because you see these skin manifestations, doesn't mean automatically that this patient has COVID-19. So it's important to talk to your patient about other possibilities too, and not just scare them right off the bat, especially if they don't have symptoms. We really want to just watch those patients and uh, watch them closely. And if they do develop symptoms, then, you know, we do need to um, get them tested. Um, some people are going so far as to um, recommend, you know, they quarantine themselves at home just in case, you know, give them an incubation period of a few days. And if, you know, they don't develop symptoms, um, other people are going so far as, as recommending serology testing, um, you know, if they've had these symptoms and if they've had the skin manifestations. Now, with the, is, is a lot of these recommendations based more on testing availability or is there based on CDC guidelines? So uh, it's, it's largely been geared towards a little bit of both. Um, right now, we're the, the molecular PCR tests are, the hospitals are having trouble keeping up with the inpatients that they have. Um, so it's, it's, you know, not everybody is able, everybody that wants a molecular test is able to get them. The serology tests are a little bit more available now. Um, you know, I know that, uh, you know, we've been able to, uh, get them as an outpatient basis. Um, you can go through your insurance and, and even practitioners can get them. Um, I know that's been available and I know uh, people that have uh, been tested just because of you know, the fact that we're still seeing patients and we may have been exposed to it and not develop symptoms, um, you know, and, and, you know, what's, what's worth noting is the, if you are going to get this um, antibody test, the false positive rate is pretty high, you know, so just because you're testing positive doesn't mean that um, go out in the community and you're immune, you know, and even if it isn't a false positive, we don't know that it's, we don't know how long it's going to give you immunity. And, you know, we don't know whether it's going to be full immunity. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, and just so everybody knows, with the uh, all the testing for the COVID antibodies, I know a, a lot of us want to know if we've been exposed. Some of us feel like we may have been exposed, um, especially you know if you've been sick for a while and you weren't sure what it was or you didn't see your doctor. Um, there's different types of testing. Um, I know a lab, uh, some labs, uh, you know, out by us, I know Quest Lab is doing uh, blood tests where you can get antibody tested just through a normal blood draw, uh, which is something you can do out of your office. Um, there are a lot of point of care tests coming out of China. Um, these tests uh, look like a, a, a big size index card. If you've ever seen the uh, uh, HCG test from uh, for pregnancy tests for before surgery, they look like a, a real thick credit card and you put a few drops of blood on them. Um, the problem with these tests is that they've been, uh, the CDC has allowed labs to self-validate whether they're uh, accurate or not. And so there's a big financial incentive for people to do so. And while these tests can be valuable, um, there's been a, a higher cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses that you may have uh, ran into in your life. And, um, That's the interference we're just talking about. and so we need to just be aware that um, some of these tests are better than others. And uh, just uh, even if you, it says you have antibodies, you know, you still want to be careful and use the proper PPE so that um, you don't think that you're invincible and immune. Um, the other thing that Dr. Lovato mentioned earlier is we don't know how long um, immunity is for. We don't know if this virus is going to mutate over time. We don't know uh, what our long term um, interaction and relationship with this virus is going to be. Think about your influenza. You know, every year it, it mutates and we have something different. So we just want to be aware and, uh, you know, that just uh, even if you have antibodies, it, it doesn't say how much you have and how much you're going to be protected at this time. Um, let's see if we have any more questions here. Feel free to send your questions in um, via Facebook Live. Yeah, Here's a question. Uh, it said I saw uh, two or three cases. Can we pull that back up, please? Have our IT person point it up, please. Baffled me. Understandable in winter, looks like frostbite, then saw one in warm weather, unresponsive to oral steroids and topical creams. Other viruses cause similar question or similar symptoms, question mark. So the question is, so the question is, um, you know, looking at these lesions, um, you know, he saw one in warm weather, better, another one in the winter. Um, they're unresponsible to oral steroids and topical creams. Can other virus cause similar symptoms? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, you know, and, and it's worth noting that, you know, the earliest case I think that, you know, we've known of to date was in, in this country was November, I think, late November. I don't know the exact date. So it's unlikely that, you know, you notice coronavirus, but uh, other other viral diseases can you know, produce these similar types of lesions. Um, you know, we think that uh, currently based on, you know, some of the newer um, info that's coming out uh, that these types of lesions in COVID-19 are caused by um, the impaired coagulation response in the body. Um, so what you're seeing is actually um, the, you're seeing the, the blood vessels basically burst uh, due to uh, impaired coagulation response. Um, it can cause, in severe cases, uh, disseminated intervascular coagulation. It can cause DIC from what we're seeing. Um, we also are seeing um, in the uh, ICUs, we're seeing um, a, uh, I, I, read, I did read one study, there was a significantly different increase in the D-dimer results uh, from ICU patients that were admitted with COVID-19 compared to patients that didn't have to be admitted to the ICU. So the correlation in those cases are to be uh, made, you know, that, uh, you know, those more severe cases um, are likely due to uh, the impaired coagulation response. And I think it's important to um, also look at differential diagnoses. Um, we talked about chilblains earlier, um, things like cryoglobulinemia, cryofibrogenemia, and sickle cell anemia. Um, may also present with similar looking lesions. Um, and that's just a few of them, different types of vasculitis um, and even, um, you know, small vessel uh, emboli uh, may also present looking the same to begin with. So just be aware of that. Um, our next case, a question from Wayne Tillman. 
Um, have we seen any cases presenting as DVT? That's a good question. I thought about that myself. I have not yet seen a case um, presented uh, as uh, a deep vein thrombosis, uh, either in, in my practice or uh, in case studies. Um, you know, it's a great question for as this um, dermatology registry comes out, you know, we, we start to kind of catalog these cases and find out, um, you know, whether these, you know, coagulation issues can start as deep vein thrombosis and, and kind of go from there. Um, typically, the people that, um, you know, have issues with the uh, blood clotting in COVID-19, you know, what we're finding is that the patients uh, with the pre-existing conditions, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, uh, COPD, lung issues, kidney, uh, all these pre-existing comorbidities, um, will often present with uh, high levels of plasminogen and, and, and plasmin. Um, and uh, almost almost 100%, I think 97% of these people were uh, that were positive for the virus uh, presented with elevated D-dimer levels. Um, so it is it is something that, you know, I uh, keep an eye out for, but uh, I have not seen it. All right, next question is, are you sending patients to a PCP for testing um, or are you doing it in your office or just monitoring? So we're not currently doing uh, testing in our in our office. Um, if I see a patient, I think I think this is geared towards if you see a patient with uh, a skin lesion that you think may be COVID nineteen. Um, if the patient is symptomatic, I'm going to send them to their primary or send them to a, a testing site. If they don't show symptoms, um, I am recommending that they closely monitor. They uh, basically sequester themselves at home, self at home to monitor for symptoms um, and to be careful about coming into contact with somebody that's high risk. Um, you know, not everybody that has these skin symptoms are, sh are that have these skin symptoms actually show um, symptoms of systemic disease. And sometimes we're finding in the pediatric population, you know, they're not having breathing symptoms because their lungs are healthy and strong and this might be the only thing you see. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but it is worth noting that, um, you know, I know that a lot of, uh, information's come out in the media that children aren't affected. And, um, you know, we have had a lot of case studies, you know, that have come out that, um, you know, show that children are affected. There's, there's a, a case study that, you know, one of the first um, COVID-19, you know, case studies that we saw uh, with uh, skin manifestations was from, I believe it was a 13 year old boy in Italy um, who presented with, um, you know, these types of uh, skin lesions that we're talking about. Um, and then, two days later presented with uh, severe COVID-19 symptoms. It was later found out that the boy's uh, family was also displaying similar systems. Um, I don't think it was uh, correlated with uh, a positive test, but uh, I think that um, uh, authors were making an uh, assumption that uh, the family did have COVID-19, but didn't have access to testing. So it is worth keeping an eye out for because we can see symptoms in children. All right, continue to send in your questions here. Yeah, the other thing I do want to mention real quickly is we were talking about the uh, blood clotting role in COVID-19. Um, other questions that I've gotten have been, you know, if I see these lesions, they're likely due to an issue with uh, uh, coagulation of the blood. Should I put my patient on an anticoagulant? And it's a great question. Um, however, these most of these lesions are presenting in children and are self-limiting. Um, we are seeing some evidence of, in older patients, um, patients that have existing vascular disease presenting with these lesions. In those cases, you know, I think it is, if they are not already on anticoagulation therapy, they should be. Um, you know, just because we can see uh, an increase in critical ischemia in some of these patients um, with this disease. Um, and let's talk about uh, PPE in an office. You know, it's interesting because I work at a wound care center and, and, you know, the PPE we wear there is different than what we wear in the hospital versus, uh, you know, what different people are wearing in clinic. Is, is there any, like, recommended type of PPE that we should be wearing in clinic or what extra precautions should we be taking? Yeah, so I think the most important thing is, you know, in my opinion, is, is screening your patients as they're you know, coming through your door. You know, if you're, if you're working in an ambulatory clinic, um, you know, the recommendations are to not be seeing anybody with an elevated temperature. 
anybody that's displaying symptoms of fever, dry cough. Um, the uh, uh, CDC did just uh, come out and um, increase their um, criteria, uh, well, increase the uh, uh, different symptoms um, that uh, are out there. Um, so, you know, we're talking fever, dry cough, uh, chills, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea are also secondary symptoms. Um, we're also seeing um, uh, different, different patients uh, presenting with, uh, um, you know, all, all kinds of things. So, um, you know, I think the initial uh, question was, I got a little off topic, but the initial question was, um, you know, how do you, how do you do your PPE in the office? So, you know, we talked about face shields at the front desk. We talked about uh, giving patients clubs, but, you know, I think it's important for uh, right now, um, every practitioner to be wearing a mask when you're seeing a patient. You're, you're not, even if you don't have access to N95s, you're protecting your patients because, you know, we're at risk for contracting this disease as well and then giving it to people without knowing it. Um, you know, so if you have access to N95s, um, you know, that's obviously going to be the best to protect your patients as well as yourself. Um, you know, I, I know that, you know, most people don't have access to them. There is some, uh, uh, some uh, recommendations coming out as people are developing ways to sterilize PPE. Um, I did see a study um, recently that showed that um, you can use actually dry heat uh, in your office to sterilize uh, N95s. Um, that also will reduce some of the moisture. And then, you know, I know we've all experienced, you know, you wear an N95 for, you know, four, five, six different sessions and you start to have trouble breathing because of the moisture. And um, if you actually use the uh, high, high dry heat, um, this can get rid of some of that. Um, and we're showing that the filtration efficiency um, doesn't get lost after the sterilization process. I think the hospitals are also using the aerosolized hydrogen peroxide. Yes. Um, you know, obviously that's going to be difficult for us to have access to in our offices, but, um, you know, I thought that the dry heat was an interesting uh, idea. Uh, so uh, from Farah Mohammed, a question, are topical NSAIDs uh, contraindicated with COVID toes? Uh, as it being said, uh, to avoid NSAIDs in positive COVID patients. So it's a great question. Um, you know, I think this stems from the initial uh, news article when this pandemic uh, first got started. Uh, there were initial uh, reports out of France uh, that showed that uh, ibuprofen um, could contribute to worsening severity of the disease. Um, that was never validated or proven. Um, there's a. Um, and it wasn't a big. It wasn't a big study that I had tons just, of people. Yeah, I think it was just one practitioner that noticed it. And, and there is a. Um, you know, I did a little research on this. There is a biochemical basis for it, but it is only theoretical. Um, you know, I, everyone that I've talked to in all the studies that I've seen has not shown a correlation to using NSAIDs either orally or topically and uh, increase severity of disease or, um, you know, increase risk of contracting it. So uh, the way that I'm prescribing in my practice right now is, is I'm not avoiding NSAIDs, um, whether it's prescription or over-the-counter NSAIDs. Um, now, when we're talking about oral steroids, it's a different story, obviously, because, you know, oral steroids obviously can depress the immune system. Um, oral steroids are being used in a case-by-case -case basis in um, uh, patients with severe symptoms, uh, in acute respiratory distress symptoms, um, because they can limit the symptoms. But you have to um, correlate that with the uh, understanding that oral steroids can actually increase the viral shedding and can make the uh, virus replicate faster. So, you know, with a grain of salt, I I'm not prescribing oral steroids currently in my practice. Obviously, if your patients are on oral steroids, it's too dangerous to just abruptly stop them because of the perceived immunocompromise. Um, it's just makes more sense for those people to uh, be careful, uh, sequester themselves at home, wear the proper PE, et cetera. Okay. And also, I think you mentioned topical. Yeah, I'm not avoiding topical anti-inflammatories either. I think that's uh, a good way to, you know, limit the systemic absorption, you know, if, if you do actually believe that uh, uh, there is a risk. And we have to be careful because, um, you know, with the 24-hour news cycles we're running into right now, um, they're jumping on every little, you know, study or every little piece of information that comes out. 
Um, you know, I challenge, uh, you know, as podiatrists to actually read this, these articles ourselves, find these and, and make your own decision on them. Um, you know, we, we can't watch a newscast, you know, at, at you know, 10 o'clock at night that spends two minutes saying, oh, there might be a risk for this and then just stop treating our patients altogether. So, um, you know, do some research, you know, look on the CDC uh, website and, uh, you know, learn more about what you're telling your patients so that we don't spread false information um, you know, that the news cycle uh, may not be researching. Um, Don Hackles uh, sending a question, would UVC light work to help disinfect masks? Good question. Um, I, to my knowledge, and, and, you know, this is changing every day, um, you know, and, and we're obviously trying to stay up on this and, and you know, maintain a practice, you know, diminish patients, but, you know, still seeing patients, but I have not seen anything yet. Uh, with using UVC. So we, we do know that UVC will kill the virus. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem is uh, what intensity and for how long. Yeah. You know, UVC, um, five seconds of UVC on your skin causes cellular damage. You know, it's, it's a pretty intense UV light. This is the one if you've looked in your OR, you know, late at night, and they bring that little Clorox uh, guy in that, you know, uh, has the purple light. That's UVC light that uh, they're using to disinfect the whole room. Um, you may see them use those after you have MRSA patients and, and now with COVID patients. Um, but currently, um, it, it's something that they've been looking into. Um, they are kind of playing with what amount of UVC light you'd need for how long. Um, so there's no recommendations on that, um, as I'm aware of right now. Uh, but it is a spot for, uh, you know, looking in for future research. That's a great question, though. Um, I, I just haven't seen the protocol yet for it. The protocols that I know about are... Um, for the hospital, like we talked about earlier, the aerosolized hydrogen peroxide, um, as well as uh, a, a newer study to come out uh, showing the uh, dry heat and the exact um, specifications of that study was uh, seven degrees Celsius for 30 minutes effectively kills the virus and will decont decontaminate even home masks. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something to consider right now until we have better uh, uh, information about the UVC. And again, we're learning about all this. So the best recommendations we can make are the ones the CDC and the hospitals are, are utilizing. And, and uh, you know, in some of our hospital systems, you know, we use masks and uh, until they're visibly soiled or, um, you know, until uh, they, uh, you know, are no longer able to, to hold up. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's due to supply chain issues. But, um, you know, we do our best to kind of keep those protected. Other people I've seen are, are wearing cloth masks over their surgical masks. Um, so that it don't become soiled and then they have something they can wash also. Yeah, or even, uh, you know, some of our uh, surgical techs in the, in the OR are wearing, you know, mask on top of mask because it's, it's been shown to um, increase the life of uh, um, PPE, you know, increase the life of masks. So, you know, we're trying to do everything we can. You know, I know that uh, uh, our hospitals were, you know, when, you know, when we were in the weeds of this disease, um, they started using cloth masks. And, you know, it's it, it even, you know, you're seeing it out in the public. People are making their own masks. But, you know, we went back to the way it was in the early 1900s with cloth masks. Um, you know, I, and, you know, I think it's just uh, important to understand that this is just an ever evolving disease. And, and uh, our understanding is ever evolving as well. So um, let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, we with this COVID types of issues, um, what have you seen in practice that has changed besides patients not coming in, um, you know, for visits due to them being scared about that? Have you seen any other types of things because of this? Um, so, you know, obviously we've seen, you know, less patients coming in and we've reached out to our higher risk patients, you know, to you know, let them know that, you know, if it can wait until after this is, uh, you know, not, not necessarily we're going to get it all clear, but after the, um, this has settled down at least a little bit, you know, we encourage them to wait, but, uh, you know, we are seeing people a little he less hesitant about coming in. Um, you know, having said that, um, you know, as long as you're taking the proper precautions in your office, what I'm telling all my patients is if you need to come in, come into our office. And I think this is a great message for, you know, all of our physicians to, to give out there because if you're closed and they have to go to the ER or immediate care, they're much more likely of contracting this disease. Um, so you have to weigh those pros and cons. You gotta be, you gotta be careful, but you know, we have to keep the patients first. So, you know, us just closing our doors, thinking that, 
it's going to protect our patients may not be an accurate reality. Um, you know, which is why we've decided to stay open for you know our our our, our patients. Um, but you got to protect yourself. You know, wear the proper PE and PPE and, and uh, be careful. Um, what kind of, I just got a question in, what kind of role has televisits uh, played in your practice and, and uh, how has it been uh, to incorporate that into your program? That's a great question. Um, it's it's uh, taken a large role, um, you know, with, with, this, uh, with this disease. So, you know, before this, you know, I think like many of us, um, you know, our practice was not doing any televisits. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, a, a handful every day and, and, you know, patients that come to the office that have an emergent condition and the follow-up can be handled in a televisit, um, you know, we're recommending, especially if they're a higher risk patient to have a follow-up with a televisit, you know, with, with video, um, you know, we can, we can discuss things, we can, um, you know, they can show, uh, they can show us any kind of, uh, you know, skin symptoms. It's obviously difficult to do a physical exam, but you know we can hopefully bridge the gap until these patients can be seen safely in the office. Um, you know, it, it's it's worth if you haven't started telemedicine, which uh, I know many of you probably have. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to set up. There are a lot of different platforms. Um, I know we've used uh, we use Doxy uh, in our practice. Um, you know, we've used FaceTime. You know, FaceTime. There's a Skype. A, a Skype. I mean, anything with, uh, with, with video, um, even, even chat services actually uh, will um, uh, be allowed under some insurances. So what you have to understand is that previously, uh, you, in order to do a televisit, you had telehealth visit, you had to have a secure system that was uh, essentially um, an extra service that was an add-on to utilize these services. Um, after uh, COVID hit, um, the uh, government allowed for use of uh, any type of video face, and that's where FaceTime and Skype and other services like that became available, as long as the the spirit of HIPAA was uh, was kept in kept in thought. And so that's a lot, a lot of us, because a lot of my patients, you know, can FaceTime their grandkids, and they're able to at least get that. Um, another thing that's been helpful is some of our uh, is when you have some of these visits, especially if you have wound patients, is have uh, your FaceTime visits when the nurse is there changing their wound. I found that, that she can kind of do a physical exam for you and get some information from you, touch an area, see if there's any purulence and see if it feels warm um, compared to uh, what you're looking at. That's a great point. I've, I've even had uh, telehealth visits from uh, wound care in nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities. Uh, so, you know, our, our patients that we're seeing in the hospital that get discharged to some of these facilities it doesn't make sense for us to go into these facilities and then, uh, you know, potentially get droplet on ourself and, and transfer it in the community. And, and, you know, if, if someone's already there that can actually, you know, do a FaceTime uh, and, and, you know, show you, you know, your post-op visit. And then, you know, I just recently uh, after an infection case that I treated, um, you know, was able to use FaceTime with the nurse um, they showed me the surgical wound. It was time for the sutures to come out. They took out the sutures and, you know, it's a, it's a very seamless process and it, you know, allows us to still be safe and not be going into these nursing homes that, you know, a lot of times we have to just assume that these patients in nursing homes are positive for COVID-19. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we don't have access to, you know, the, the space suits like the hospital does and uh, the total joint suits and things like that. It's a great question with LL. Yeah. The next question um, says some surgical centers are opening up for elective cases next month with testing of staff, doctors, and patients to be done beforehand. Even with this, what are your thoughts on elective surgeries at this time? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, I know in, in our in our region, um, the elective surgery restrictions through Advocate are getting lifted, lifted on May 15th, May 11th. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, Northwestern is Northwestern's May one. Well, the, the yeah, Governor Pritzker uh, had originally talked about April or May first for uh, elective cases. Um, it seems that they pushed that date 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 back to uh, May eleventh now, and so you know this is kind of an ever evolving time as far as when facilities are opening up. Um, 
So when they open up to elective cases, what kind of patients are, do you feel like are appropriate or, or what are you going to be, uh, you know, take patients into? Yeah, obviously, you know, patients that were scheduled and were canceled are, are going to take priority. Um, you know, what, what, you know, I think uh, we should be really cognizant of is picking the right patients. Um, you know, the, the patients that are, you know, late seventies, early eighties with multiple comorbidities that can wait, probably should wait until the disease calms down. Probably not time for their hammer toe, huh? Probably not time. Um, the, you know, patients that are younger with, uh, you know, instability, you know, whether it's lateral ankle instability in a, in a you know, 25 to 35 year old that doesn't have any medical problems, those probably can go. You know, I think it's a case by case basis. I, you know, some of the surgery centers are, you know, saying, okay, we're going to go for elective cases, but, you know, only with patients under the age of 60 or 65 and, you know, certain comorbidities are going to be excluded and, um, you know, those, those types of situations. So I think the takeaway is to pick your patients appropriately and, and make sure you're not um, increasing their chance of, of picking up this disease just to, uh, fix their bunion a month sooner. The next question is about the virtual check-in code G2012, do I need video? So this is a large topic as far as telehealth goes. Um, the APMA has put out uh, lectures by Jeff Learman uh, describing all this and, and uh, describing uh, each level visit and, and what they mean and when to bill them. Um, the short question is, is no, you don't need video for a virtual check-in, um, but again, I encourage you to learn more about each level type of visit and what the visits uh, uh, qualify for. Um, we've got about five minutes left here. If there's any other questions people have. Uh, if we don't have any questions, um, you know, I think we covered a lot of the testing uh, updates. We covered the elective surgery restrictions. Uh, we talked about PPE updates. We talked about the blood clotting role of COVID-19. Um, the, uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to just touch on quickly, I mean, I know it's not our specialty, but, you know, I think it's important for us to know because we do get a lot of questions from patients about, you know, what are the latest treatment options? Um, so the latest treatment option that's coming out, you know, a lot of you probably read about it is uh, convalescent plasma. Basically the way this works is a patient that has had the disease can then give blood and that can be transferred into a patient that is uh, acutely ill. Um, with the antibodies to fight the disease. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what are the eligibility requirements for convalescent plasma? And this is brand new. Uh, I think there were, you know, as of an email from the uh, Northwestern system that I read today, there were only 13 patients in Wisconsin that got convalescent plasma um, in the system and uh, none in Illinois. But they basically, the way it works is in addition to the general blood donation criteria, um, recovered donor must have uh, been sick with COVID-19 or tested positive, uh, you know, with, with a with an attestation from their physician, um, or be completely recovered and free of symptoms for at least 28 days prior to donation, um, or they can be completely recovered and free of symptoms for at least 14 days and have a current negative test result from either a nasal swab or molecular test. Now important to know, differentiate the molecular test from the serology test. Um, but, you know, I, I thought that was very interesting because, you know, we're, we're still using Plaquenil, um, you, know, it, you know, even though you've, you've heard kind of mixed results in the media about it, um, the, uh, at least, you know, one of our systems has removed azithromycin uh, piggybacking on the Plaquenil. Um, remdesivir uh, has limited access um, and it's restricted to only critical care um, prescribed by infectious disease uh, and uh, ventilated patients. There's also other antivirals with limited supply. There's second line drugs, lopinavir, rotinavir, um, and uh, it, it's an alternative in mild to moderate disease. Um, steroids, as we talked about earlier, are used in uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, but it's controversial because it increases the viral shedding. Um, let me just worth noting real quick. Let me interrupt you because we're running out of time, but uh, we have another question here. Has there been limb loss due to COVID-19? If so, is it related to COVID dose? Yeah, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, we, we are seeing 
um, lesions that could be COVID-19 related in older patients that have existing um, limb ischemia. Um, the idea is that it's contributing to it and, and possibly causing worsening acute um, vascular insufficiency. Um, you know, I don't know of any personally any cases uh, today. Like that I've heard of, yeah. uh, that, of, of it's tough though because developing that exact correlation in patients that have existing PVD. Um, you know, how do you differentiate these you know lesions with arterial lesions? Um, you know, if you have a patient that's COVID positive develops these vac vascular lesions, um, you know, then you could make a correlation. I, I, that's what this uh, that's what this database is going to give us a better idea of. Um, you know, people, uh, practitioners uploading their case studies, and you know, maybe we can make these correlations. I, I haven't heard of one yet, though. Direct cause and effect. Right. But it's a great question. I, I think I think the answer is it's feasible. Yeah. You know, especially to lose a toe or part of a toe. Yeah. Uh, with something like this, we're not. But you know, worth worth noting is we're not seeing this in children. We're not seeing it in adolescents. You know, the only you know people we're even questioning this in is is our you know our, our older population that probably that have existing peripheral vascular disease. Anyway, um, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we end the lecture on that? Um, you know, a couple things. Uh, some housekeeping here. Number one, um, uh, there will be a CE code. Um, we've made the code easy to remember. It's one, two, three, four, five, six for anybody who uh, uh, hasn't, uh, or anybody who wants to get a CE credit, there's one hour available for tonight. Uh, number two is next week, uh, we're gonna have a, another lecture uh, by John Juliana. Um, uh, it's going to be on uh, the intervention, or podiatric practice intervention. Um, this is a non-CE event, um, but it's gonna give you tips on, on how to keep your practice afloat and how to uh, try to thrive in this uh, current change in, in how we practice. So I want to thank Dr. Lovato uh, for speaking. Again, I'm Dr. Patrick McEnany, um, and we hope to have more of these uh, CE-based sessions in the future. So uh, check your email and look out for them in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully this was informative and uh, um, helped answer some of your questions. Bye.